your mind lies to you. In fact, mine lies to me and theirs lies to them. And when you understand this principle of projections, psychological projections, first coined by people like Freud and Carl Jung, what you'll understand is why you get accused of doing things that you never did, or why people will claim that you said things that you never said and never believed in the first place. Almost as though we're all walking through the world with this TV set that is playing a film that we're responsible for carrying inside, but we don't really know that it's happening. This is one of the weakest parts of our species, in my personal opinion. It actually makes me believe that there is something potentially fundamentally flawed in our cognition. And I know that that is a weighty, dualistic way of describing things, but it's my honest belief sometimes that when you see the horrendous acts that people do against others because of projections, because of hate for a certain class of people or color of skin or, you know, like the atrocities that are unleashed on people of color just walking down the street in the wrong suburban neighborhood and to get viciously attacked by some white woman. It's remarkable because when you understand that the attacker has a story in their mind about this innocent person and that they're projecting their bias, they're projecting their everything onto them and hurting them. And it's horrific when you think about it. That's an extreme example. If you've been following me for a while, you know I like to talk about the extreme so we can dial it back and talk about the everyday and make it a little more relatable. We all project to some degree and fundamentally every person projects at a ratio that is unique to them and this ratio is somewhat hidden so if you have a tv set installed in your mind that has programs and episodes that are just playing on repeat for your entire life you don't know when you're unconscious that this is happening all you know is that you see, you think, you feel, you react. And that's your reality. When you start to awaken to metacognition and understanding what is happening in your own mind on the consciousness expansion journey, or the spiritual awakening journey, or simply just the personal development, personal transformational journey, what you're going to understand is that you sometimes map stories onto other people without your consent. Meaning this is this process that happens in our cognitive features. I say features generously because I believe it's a criticism personally, but trying to be balanced here. The feature of your data set in your mind and how everything is processing reality is so buggy because you could take a pristine example of a job opportunity and pristine example is a weird way to say it. What I mean is an opportunity that is really, really potent and ripe to change your life in the best possible ways. 
but let's say that you have some fear around having a micromanaging boss because you have a lot of experience with problems with authority or people not trusting you or not understanding your value right out of the gate. So they made you prove yourself and perhaps you come from a culture where this is just the norm. There's a strong hierarchy and you have to go through the ranks. And so you're shifting careers and you're at a job interview, the perfect opportunity that you don't know it's the perfect opportunity. And you show up and you show up a little defensively because you're carrying the wound of the past with you. And the energy that you bring to that room and to the person that's sitting across the table or the desk rubs them the wrong way because you're not fully letting go of all of your fears in the past. You're not manifesting cleanly. You're dragging along old realities with you. You don't get the job. And depending on your personality and how you interpret things, and if you have any other chips on your shoulders, you might internalize this in a negative way without understanding your part in it. This is why I believe that it's not a feature to humanity, it's actually a bug. Because imagine for a moment that you had the awareness of all of your programming all of your unconscious thoughts, all of your projection systems, how they were wired, what episodes were running on repeat. Imagine that you knew that before you walked into that office and imagine that you understood the power of being a creator and doing things fresh. And imagine that you have this little actual feature, transhumanism feature, just a little plug for that. Not the weird, creepy kind but the kind where you have full sovereignty and the ability to control all of your unconscious processes. Like you, as the operator of your operating system, are the designer of your operating system, and nothing goes unchecked by you. That's the transhumanism that I'm talking about. Imagine for a moment that you walk into that interview prepared because you understand your psychological makeup and you sit down and you accurately gauge this is how you break projections you accurately gauge the opportunity in front of you you accurately assess the compatibility and the fit of you in that culture in that role in that environment with that boss who happens to also have a inclination similar to you where they don't want to micromanage They have no interest in it. They just want you to shine and to give you the platform and the arena for which you can do your best work. And perhaps it's a gift of theirs. But when you're lost in the projection system, you don't know that. So you might ask them kind of in an antagonizing way about their leadership ability, about how they feel about micromanaging indicating that you're still a little traumatized from your past and you might be a little aggressive in your tone even if you're not physically pushing anything off the table or them off their chair you can still carry an energy fragment of your resentment from the past and project that onto a person now all of a sudden we're breaking the projection system and taking it all away And you can see clearly, boom, eye to eye, with no interference, because your projection system is offline, or you've rewired it, and so it's no longer impacting your behavior, your energy, and your attitude. In my opinion, this is what becoming conscious is. It's one layer of it. There are multi facets to becoming conscious. We look outward. We become conscious about the collective, about 
the multiverse, about history, about health and time and space and macrocosm and microcosms. But then we also become conscious about what is happening within. When we are dedicated to the personal development journey and the self-mastery journey, we understand that everything starts from within. And we prioritize fixing what's underneath our hood, whatever needs to be fixed and enhancing all of our attributes and our strengths as creators because we grasp finally that reality emanates outward from exactly what is happening inside. And of course, there are influences and pressure points along the way from the outside. It is not in a vacuum. But we control our part, influence the inner workings of our minds, and we start to realize that everybody's walking around with the TV set, that they don't have the remote to at first. Boop, boop. I remember recently I was watching this creator on TikTok. It's somebody that bought a bunch of land in Texas and very desolate part of Texas and interesting, interesting character. He's more than a character, he's a person, but the way he presents himself and his personality and his values, he's just a very interesting person. So he was with some people who were living on his land. They were driving to the top of this mountain or maybe to the Rio Grande River. There's nobody else around. And there's a couple of people in the truck and you can't see anybody, but you can hear them talking. And he's shooting the scenery. And he has this moment where he looks up at the top of this hill that they're sort of cresting around in this pickup truck on this dirt road. And it's bumpy and he's trying to hold the camera still. And it's charming. <laughs> and it's, and it's uh, unfettered casualness. And he says, wow, it, it's kind of like there uh, there are people up there, and they're gonna throw boulders down at us. They're gonna block our path, and this is a perfect example of a projection system, where he perceives, even though there was literally they were the only people around for miles, an empty, vast space, his mind was building in a story that there were people at the top of the hill. He might have even visualized them for a moment. And that they, seeing them and the truck, were going to block them and potentially crush them and harm them. He sees enemies where there are none. And what's fascinating about him is that he escaped the system because he perceives enemies perhaps where there are none perhaps we can't say because there are obviously enemies out there right but his whole ethos is that everything is corrupt everything is broken and he has to rebuild a city of independent, like-minded conspiracy theorists <laughs> at, who want to live off the grid. And there are many conspiracy theorists that would say there are indeed several enemies and there are many systems that are broken. And this is why I believe that projections are a criticism because we never know how much an individual's ratio is. How much is somebody projecting enemies where there are none? 
And indeed, they were not toppled with boulders. There were no people at the top of the hill. That's one example out of many examples that this, I don't know, 40 some odd person has lived in his life. And I'm sure that there have been other examples that there have been people with boulders. But you get my point. There is an individual ratio. Nine times out of 10 is his mind automatically projecting enemies where there aren't any. Or is it five times out of 10? Two times out of 10? It seems relevant, right? If, you, if you're going to go and live with him and he's got a trailer full of guns, many high-powered ones that got him banned for showing on TikTok Live. And you would want to understand somebody's psychology like that if they can quickly turn an enemy from a friend. And what I found interesting is that there had been other people that have come to live with him on his land. And there's not record of everybody. Almost as though he deletes videos. But there are some questions about stuff that has piled up apparently. And these, these are all rumors, hearsay. I'm just an observer from afar. I don't even follow him because I don't want to even be that closely associated. So I will literally go and search it if I want to check in because I, I don't want any tie to this person because I am frightened for people who don't understand projections. And I'm frightened for people who associate so closely to somebody who seems so disturbed. So when we are making choices about who to affiliate with and what groups to get involved in and what decisions to make when it comes to people in our inner circle, it would be very important information to understand if somebody is suffering from projections that turn people into enemies. when they're not, because I have both been on the receiving end of this, and it's frightening when that happens, and I've also found my own mind doing it in the past. Almost as though when we are frightened, we can get lost in stories in our minds, which may or may not have any basis in reality. We could be looking at an empty, desolate desert and suddenly be overcome with this feeling. There's going to be this villain that jumps out of nowhere. Where does this come from? How is it possible that we could be mapping onto, on our visual field, a potential crisis that doesn't exist. It's one of the reasons that people sometimes advocate for not having guns in the home. Because what happens when somebody mistakes a loved one for an intruder? That's a projection system going awry. Your spouse comes home, but you're scared for no reason. And your nervous system gets the best of you. And you reach for a weapon. 
and you shoot. And then by the time you realize that you've made a mistake, it's too late. This is one of the arguments because these accidents happen. There's something that takes over us where fear eclipses our ability to see people clearly. This is why I believe that there is something fundamentally flawed with humans. Why would we ever have friendly fire? And these are physical examples, but there are many, many examples of people and relationships and things start to go south and they start to paint pictures of them differently. They even recall different memories. Almost as though the image in their mind is changing. I have seen this happen to people that I care about, who I knew very, very well. But there was a mutual person that didn't like how they handled a situation. And I was mediating. And I was shocked to find that this other person was crafting this narrative about them being evil. I was frightened. I was actually frightened for their safety because the way that they were talking made it seem like with all of their vindictiveness, which they were prone to, they were going to do something. And yes, the person in question could have handled things differently, but I knew their heart. I knew that it was more cowardliness than anything else. There was no evil intent. They were conflict avoidant. They didn't know how to break up with somebody. They didn't know how to disappoint somebody that was really, really into them. And so to see the narrative being spun about them, I tried to set the record straight, but in doing so, I put myself in the crosshairs potentially of this person. And they also started seeing me as colluding with them in a really bizarre turn of events. People's minds go on these tirades and start spinning in directions that are really disconcerting sometimes. Again, these are extreme examples, but you can see examples of this in everybody. There was a famous experiment, the SCAR experiment. Psychologist brought a group of people, I've heard it talked about many different ways. They brought a group of women in to um, a center and they said, look, we are testing to see if there's any discrimination, physical discrimination, when people are hiring. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you a disfiguring scar on your face. It's going to be large and gnarly. They didn't say it like that, of course, but then we're going to sit you down in front of the interviewer and we're going to see if you have been discriminated against. You're going to report back your experiences. So the makeup artist puts on this huge scar across their face. And right before they go into the interview, they say, oh, we just need to touch things up, you know, because some time had passed. They were given instructions and things of that nature. We're going to touch it up before you go in there. So they didn't get to see the touch-up, though. It was like as they were walking out the door, the makeup artist is like, let me just take this and fix it just for a moment. And then they continued into the next room where the interview was. Now, what these women participants didn't know is that the makeup artist actually removed the scar. So in their minds, the last time they looked in the mirror, they saw this gnarly looking disfiguring scar, very realistic. In their mind, the makeup artist touched it up and in their mind, they're walking into the interview with said scar. They sit down and what they perceive because of their projection system, because of what they are expecting, 
because of this program that runs that I believe is hackable when we're unconscious and we're none the wiser. But also when we're conscious, we can hack it for the power of good. So it's, it's not all bad here. So they're sitting down and all of them perceive that they're being discriminated against because they are disfigured. They even remember disparaging remarks referencing the scar. How is this possible? Because they had no scar. How is it possible that they could actually sit down in front of somebody and perceive jokes made at their expense referencing their disfigurement? And they could perceive actually being discriminated against for their physical disfigurement? And they had no disfigurement. This is what I mean about the mind. Spinning stories. All of those participants came back and said, yes, there's discrimination here. Can you believe it? When we understand that how we show up in reality matters, But how we show up in reality is dictated by our projection system, and none of us are excluded from this. And each of us have this unknown ratio that's just silently going on in the background, silently projecting, sometimes in extreme ways and sometimes in small ways, but all very significant because it literally controls how we speak, how we behave, who we say yes to, who we run from, who we go towards. And when we see clearly, that's when we are fresh and able to really harness the power of being a manifester and a creator. This is why shadow work is so important, but before we really embark on the journey, like, what does that mean? What, what does shadow work actually mean? This is what it is. It's understanding what your mind is really doing on your behalf and saying, mm, not this, and yes, this, and creating yourself as a masterpiece, which then emanates out into the world. where the world then becomes your masterpiece because you are a master creator who understands exactly what is happening 